Welcome back to State of Belief Radio. I'm producer Ray Kirstein. While Welton Gaddy is the voice of this program, State of Belief is a production of Interfaith Alliance. And so although Welton might not be super eager to have us focus on him for a change, that's exactly what Interfaith Alliance is doing at its annual Walter Cronkite Faith and Freedom Award ceremony in New York City on Sunday, November 11th. You see, hosting this show every week is the least of Welton's worries. He's been president of Interfaith Alliance, based in Washington, D.C., for 15 years. And on top of that, he's the pastor for preaching and worship at Northminster Baptist Church in Monroe, Louisiana. Now, on this show, Welton usually asks compelling questions and then steps out of the way to let his guests have their say. But his Interfaith Alliance salutes both his leadership and his lifetime of work defending faith and freedom. We really wanted to get Welton Gaddy to talk about himself a little bit more. So, Welton... Welcome to State of Belief Radio. Thanks very much, Ray. You know, you mention it occasionally in context, but you are an ordained Baptist minister. You spent years in leadership positions in the Southern Baptist Convention, and you come from a pretty conservative background. Would you talk about that history a little bit? I'd be glad to. I grew up in a very uh, fundamentalist home. Uh, The primary value was love. Uh, The result of that was acceptance. Uh, my mother and father were both uh, very conservative Christians. Uh, my dad educated a little bit better than my mom. But uh, the, the prevalence of love in the home and acceptance uh, within the family uh, was the foundation that allowed me to ask questions, to look into areas that uh, not all my colleagues were looking into. And then when finding truth there or finding challenges there that uh, deserve a response of change, being able to talk through that uh, with my parents, knowing that it would not affect their love for me, uh, knowing that they might have trouble with some of my thoughts and uh, desires for actions, but that it would never put me uh, outside their love. I was, um, was very fortunate to have tremendous teachers. Uh, One of the things that's uh, ironic and most people don't know about uh, the the Southern Baptist Convention was that uh, in the early days of that convention, when when I was a a member of it in the 60s and 70s and 80s, the uh, institutions, the universities and the seminaries offered the very best of university education and uh, theological education in the seminaries. I mean, our our teachers, professors were equivalents to Union Seminary and the other great ones uh, in the nation. And though the theology was often conservative, the vision of those people was broad. Uh, It was almost as if a conservative approach to the Bible produces a liberal approach to social issues. That's how I've found it. That's how I've experienced it. And uh, actually, it is is to that kind of uh, vision of Scripture and society uh, that I'm still committed. So it almost parallels what we've heard some folks in the political world say over recent years, that they didn't leave, for example, the Republican Party, but it left them. Is that kind of the experience you had with the changes in the Southern Baptist Convention, and then you're having to move away from that? Yeah, the changes that took place in the Southern Baptist Convention came uh, primarily from uh, outside the convention. I, I remember the uh, the very first year that I saw this beginning to take shape was when officers of the convention invited into the Resolutions Commission of the uh, of the convention, uh, a representative of the Reagan White House, and uh, that was a clear sign that things were changing. Because uh, when I went to work for the uh, Social Ethics Agency in the Southern Baptist Convention, working primarily in the realm of government and uh, religion. Uh, there was that old mantra, though Baptists would have never called it a mantra, uh, that religion and politics don't mix. And we saw that changing, uh, saw it changing rapidly. And the people that were facilitating the change were what I would call uh, theological fundamentalists 
and uh, political power brokers who knew that within a an organization like the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, there was the possibility of gaining a major block of voters for uh, Republican values. When I came to Washington uh, to, to be a part of the Interfaith Alliance, one of the first speeches I gave, interestingly enough, was to a, uh, a group of Republicans. Uh, and, and Republicans were a major part of birthing uh, the Interfaith Alliance. And I said to them, I remember well, uh, that the same people that stole my denomination are the same people that are trying to steal the Republican Party, and, and you better watch out, because they used traditional language, but they misinterpreted it um, so that they could pull on the emotions as well as the traditions of people and uh, label some as liberals and some as trusted conservatives. Um, it was clearly never a theological movement. It was from day one a political movement that got a lot of bounce from Pat Robertson's run for the presidency and victory in Iowa, and then the, the snowball just kept getting bigger and bigger until uh, it was too big for me uh, to be in front of. How did you first become involved in interreligious work? Actually, uh, my background before coming to the Interfaith Alliance was more in ecumenical work than it was uh, in uh, interfaith work. Uh, I know that some some interfaith work early on uh, was was designated primarily as uh, Jews and Christians uh, talking to each other. Um, in the in the sphere of religion from which I came, to have a Baptist go to a Presbyterian Thanksgiving service was a big uh, achievement. Um, but uh, I, I, I found the great challenge in uh, ecumenicity uh, between Protestants and Catholics, and that was one of the uh, major focuses of, of my outreach uh, in an ecumenical ministry. When I came to the Interfaith Alliance, I, uh, I was not that familiar with uh, some of the religions that had been members of the Interfaith Alliance since the beginning. But uh, one of my goals, uh, encouraged by the board that uh, called me to the Interfaith Alliance, was to expand our outreach uh, so that we did indeed have, as part of the Interfaith Alliance, representatives of all of the great religions of the world. And then the next major step was finding a way for those people who are interested in religion and interested in religion's influence in the nation, but themselves are not affiliated with any uh, religion. And um, I think we have uh, we've made a lot of progress in that regard. We've not tried to define religion for anybody, and we have a lot of members now who uh, don't claim any particular religion for their own, but who know that uh, the relationship between religion and government is so important that it shapes uh, much of the government's influence in our lives. Can you talk about how you came to lead a national grassroots organization focused on defending religious freedom and also defending the concept of separation of church and state in an interfaith context? You know, right, it's an interesting uh, question. Um, looking back on it, uh, when I came to the Interfaith Alliance, the, the first item on the strategic agenda was to get the name of the Interfaith Alliance in front of the American people and then help identify uh, what our mission was all about. Uh, because there had not been great public exposure to it, um, I started uh, deliberately, intentionally, accepting every invitation that I got to speak on whatever the subject was. And if it was a, a media appearance, uh, it was important to me to take it, whether it was at the center of our mission or not. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the very first uh, uh, major issues that I uh, talked about uh, was on an MSNBC program uh, in which I was 
uh, pitted against Jerry Falwell, and we were talking about the role of, of women in ministry. And uh, I remember Falwell was going on and on pontificating um, about his views and what, what a great Baptist he was. And I said, uh, Dr. Falwell, I'm sorry. Uh, I know that you've been invited to uh, participate uh, in uh, Baptist conventions before, and you've always turned them down. And so I want you to know you're talking to a real Baptist uh, who comes out of the historic Baptist tradition, and uh, we're, we're very much in disagreement with each other. Um, but uh, for me, it, it, was, it was important for, to establish the fact that we were people who appreciated religion. We're not really ready to give up on religion, but we also wanted religion to maintain its integrity. The Interfaith Alliance itself uh, came out of concerns raised by the Christian Coalition and Pat Robertson's assumption that the Christian Coalition spoke uh, for all the religions in the nation. And uh, the intent of the founders uh, was to say, no, not all religious people think the same way. Pat Robertson does not speak for us. Uh, I had to say, I'm a Christian, but the Christian coalition is far away from my beliefs and my interest in uh, civic society, civil society, and social ethics. Um, And so that distinction had to be made. That was the foundation then for moving into the wider community. And uh, it's been really one of the joys and one of the best educations of my life uh, to encounter so many people from other religions uh, with whom I found common ground in friendship and uh, whom I consider to be trusted colleagues today. Now, one thing a lot of folks may not know is that you also somehow maintain a pastoral ministry in Louisiana. Would you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, I uh, I serve a uh, church in Louisiana that was a, a new church. It was a church that came out of, uh, in, in part, the schism that had gone on in the Southern Baptist Convention. We started out, and that church actually is still being members of uh, the uh, SBC, but it got uh, so bad, and we were so embarrassed by uh, being a part of it that we withdrew um, and I, I think uh, I, it would be hard to know who was happier the day we withdrew, whether it was me or whether those we withdrew from, because they uh, were equally pleased by our decision, I think. Um, but uh, when the uh, invitation came to uh, become the uh, leader of the Interfaith Alliance, I resigned from uh, the congregation and uh, had every intent of, uh, of moving to Washington and staying just here. Um, but when I got to Washington, I found that there are a lot of people in this city uh, who talk about religion and really don't know much about religion. Uh, people who talk about houses of worship and uh, do not have the experiences about how houses of worship make decisions and engage in ministries that is helpful. And so um, I w- that was going on in my mind at that same period of time, the uh, search committee for a new pastor for that for Northminster Church came back and said, would you be willing to come back to Northminster most weekends, uh, at least maybe five out of six or something like that, and serve as pastor for preaching and worship uh, and continue your uh, work with the Interfaith Alliance? Well, that was really a welcome invitation for me. I love congregational life, and I was of the, uh, the firm uh, opinion that maintaining my relationship to that congregation would be good for the work that I needed to do for the Interfaith Alliance because we wouldn't be talking about religion theoretically. It would still be experientially for me. I would have one foot uh, in the nation's capital, uh, and I would also have a foot in a local community. Uh, that was um, what, by whatever measurement, miles and miles away from uh, the nation's capital. And I have to say, I think that's still true. Um, I made a deal with the church that if I thought the, uh, that this ministry was hurting the church, I would uh, end it. And if it was hurting me, I would end it. Uh, but we have found a mutual um, enjoyment and uh, fulfillment in it. 
uh, and so I think it was a I think it was a good decision. One of the the great joys of my life was that. Uh, one uh, weekend when I was gone and, and there was a business meeting in the congregation and the church actually voted to make my interfaith ministry with the Interfaith Alliance uh, to consider that a part of its mission as well. So uh, it's been a really good experience and uh, I'm, I'm glad that both entities have, uh, have been a part of my life. Walton, in addition to leading Interfaith Alliance and your pastoral ministry, you're also a husband and a father. You found time to write over 20 books. What keeps you going at this pace, and what areas of the work do you find the most satisfying? Um, some people would say insanity keeps me going uh, in this work. There is a um, there's there's a deep passion within me, Ray, um, regarding the importance of religious freedom, which comes straight out of the historical Baptist tradition. Um, that's something a lot of people don't know. It was always a, a, a real tenet of our belief that church and state remain separate. That came because many of my predecessors in the Baptist tradition before uh, the First Amendment to the Constitution was drafted and accepted, had been in jails up and down the eastern seaboard uh, because they had refused to pay uh, the tax for a license that would allow them uh, to preach, uh, as they said, preach the gospel and be ministers. So uh, that that passion was there. But I also um, had had been really restless with some of the unchallenged beliefs and unchallenged biblical interpretations that had been uh, right essential uh, in my faith experience with my family and and with the uh, churches in in which I had had experiences. And um, I I always had thought uh, that the tendency which comes into religion seemingly in all religions, the tendency to say, well, actually, we're the only ones that's right, uh, when you really look at it that way, uh, and narrows down to to where it's a small world. I had always thought that the very nature of religion should not be uh, reductive, it should be expansive, and that uh, the call to be a global citizen and to be involved in a faith that engaged an international world uh, was important. Whether you call that progressive religion or whether you just call that uh, really good religion. And uh, and those are issues that were burning inside and uh, they were issues that, uh, that drove me uh, and have driven me uh, over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. And when that's the case, um, I, I, you know, sometimes I get tired, obviously. I, I get tired. I get very tired. Sometimes I get very discouraged. But the, the fire uh, that is within those commitments and interests uh, is what keeps me going. And uh, every time I try to think about, well, you know, things aren't going well, let's just kind of quit – um, I have the problem that, one, uh, I am a Christian, second, uh, I am a, a, a person of faith, and third, I'm an American. And uh, oddly, none of those will allow uh, the thought of quitting uh, to take up residence in me. At the Walter Cronkite Faith and Freedom Award ceremony coming up on November 11th, you'll also be awarding the President's Award to Mitchell Gold for work defending faith and freedom. Would you talk about that, please? Yeah, I will. Uh, we started the President's Award a few years back. I, it has not been given every year, uh, but I wanted an opportunity to express affirmation and to give encouragement uh, to people that were really doing very special work in this nation. Uh, Mitchell Gold is uh, an outstanding businessman. Uh, he, he works with his uh, business partner, Bob Williams, as a manufacturer of uh, furniture uh, that uh, supplies people all over the United States and all over the world. But uh, Mitchell also has uh, 
an avocation to which he gives almost as much time uh, but doesn't receive money for it, and, and that is working for GLBT rights um, in America and around the world. And uh, Mitchell is, is very deserving of uh, the President's Award and of many other awards, uh, both publicly and privately. And, and honestly, some though, though his public work is known, some of his best work has been private. In sitting down with pastors of often fundamentalist churches, And having conversations with them, challenging their hatred of him because he is a gay man, uh, challenging the kind of gospel they preach that is non-inclusive, rather uh, pushes uh, him and his kind away, Um, those have been kinds of conversations that have changed in, in sometimes people's minds. Others have been hardened in their positions, but at least Mitchell knows that the conversation, the outreach came from him. And then he has been a a prolific writer about GLBT issues, has a great book on uh, the crisis with teenagers uh, growing up with the awareness that they are gay and not knowing how to relate that to their family and uh, to their religious community and social community. Um, and and then he has been a, a very effective in sitting down with uh, media people across the country and giving them some insight into how best to talk about this issue and what is helpful and what is not. Um, it's it's really a pleasure to uh, be able to choose Mitchell for this award this year, and it will be a great joy uh, to give him that award. I didn't say elsewhere in the interview, and I should say now, that uh, to be associated by this award with uh, the name of Walter Cronkite uh, is an humbling experience. Uh, I, I also should say that one of the great gifts of my life was the friendship of Walter Cronkite and the ability to get to know him better, uh, to get to learn from him and to see the kind of courage and values that he held. So um, in a setting uh, that bears the name of one of the greatest journalists in America and uh, a, a man who was known as the most trusted man in America, uh, it will be a great evening to give uh, Mitchell that award and for me uh, to receive uh, the Cronkite Faith and Freedom Award. The Reverend Dr. C. Welton Gaddy is this year's recipient of the Walter Cronkite Faith and Freedom Award to be given by Interfaith Alliance at a gala ceremony Sunday, November 11th in New York City. Mitchell Gold will be receiving the President's Award at that ceremony. Complete information is available at interfaithalliance.org.